Good morning. And uh, greetings and welcome to you, my friends and family here at First Church in Logan, Ohio. We also want to welcome all those who are visiting with us from the ethereal world of space and time. Those of you who visit with us via Facebook or some Instagrams, some Zooms, and uh, however else you may, may entertain yourself with our presence and yours, we greet you and welcome you to our service of worship. Good morning. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. Jesus proclaims, you are the light of the world. Thanks be to God. Call to confession. Even in our most, at our most faithful, we stand in need of grace. Because of God's unfailing love, mercy is promised, even before we speak the truth. In humility, with confidence, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we are truly sorry and repent of what we have done and what we have not done. Show us the paths of your prophetic way. Open our eyes to new ventures. Help us to love our neighbors as ourselves. Forgive us and renew us in the name of life abundant. Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. Hear these words of comfort. God understands and forgives. Listen and rejoice in the love of God that passes understanding. Thanks be to God. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Let us share the signs of peace of Christ with one another. May the peace of Christ be with you.
Lord, open our understanding by the power of the Holy Spirit, that as the word is proclaimed, we may receive holy wisdom to understand the gifts you have bestowed on us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We're beginning the scripture lessons this morning with Matthew 3, 1 through 13, and we are not doing the Isaiah passage. But in order for you to perhaps understand the gospel lessons a little easier, I would like to transform the cross behind me into a geographical map. As you note, the axis going crossways goes uh, east and west, and uh, the vertical one, of course, is north and south. So I'm going to speak from your perspective, not from mine, looking at the cross. If you look at the cross x-axis going east, that would be, uh, th that, that is the Sea of Galilee. Now, the Sea of Galilee is only 13 miles long. It is not the Pacific Ocean. It's more like Lake Logan. And so that is the Sea of Galilee. On the east side over here, where the Jordan River comes out, is where John the Baptist would do his baptisms, and that's where the mother-in-law of Peter lived. I've been there, I've seen her home, and been where one of the five or ten places where they say John the Baptist did his baptisms. Now, here on the west side is Nazareth, and Nazareth is only about a day's walk or less uh, from the east to, to the west and the west to the east. So Jesus and John the Baptist were basically only a day apart. Now Jesus lived on the west side in Nazareth, but when John the Baptist was executed, Jesus left Nazareth and went to the, is that spire going north, just above where they intersect? Well, that's Capernaum. Jesus left Nazareth on the west side and went north of the Sea of Galilee because Jerusalem, which is 80 miles south, would have a little tougher time getting to him because he's going to be on the other side of the lake heading up towards Syria and Damascus. So let's, let's do that again because the whole Bible lessons this morning uh, are around the Sea of Galilee. Okay, North is Syria. Just below that is Capernaum where Jesus hid out and then there's a Sea of Galilee. The west side is Nazareth. East side is John the Baptist on the Jordan River just coming out of the Sea of Galilee where he was doing his baptisms. And then deep south, like at the bottom of the cross, that would be Jerusalem and that area. Just think, this whole space takes place within 30 miles east-west and 90 miles north-south. I mean, it's like Logan and Lancaster basically. So uh, when I read the scripture and, and you sort of hear some of that scripture, uh, you, you'll get an idea that this was a close kind of community. We begin with the third chapter of the Gospel of Matthew. It, it is a wicked chapter. In those days, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness of Judea. He proclaimed, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's near. This is the one of whom we speak in the prophet Isaiah when Isaiah said, the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord and make his path straight. Now John, a little bit different, John wore clothing of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then Jerusalem, all Judea and all the region around the Jordan were going out to John the Baptist. And they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But when John saw the many Pharisees and Sadducees coming for his baptism, he said to them, don't forget the sermon last week when Gail talked about the Pharisees being rather smug folks. Well, here it is. Uh, when he saw the Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said this, oh, this is cool. You brood of vipers, 
who warned you to flee from the wrath which is to come. Woohoo! Even now, if you do not bear fruit worthy of repentance, do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our ancestors, we're going to be fine. <laughs> I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the tree. Therefore, every tree that does not bear good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water of repentance, but the one who is coming after me is more powerful than I am, and I am not worthy to carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear the threshing floor, and he will gather his wheat into the granary, but the chaff the chaff will burn with unquenchable fire. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John in the Jordan to be baptized by him. Thus is the end of that specific reason. And uh, you're going to do the other two. Thank you. Matthew 4, 12 through 25. Now when Jesus heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew to Galilee. He left Nazareth and made his home in Capernaum by the sea, the territory of Zebulon and Naphtali, so that what had been spoken through the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Land of Zephalon, land of Naphtali, by the road, by the sea, across the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. And for those who sat in the region and shallow of death, light has dawned. From the time Jesus began to proclaim, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. As he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went from there, he saw two other brothers, James the son of Zebedee and brother John in the boat with their father Zebedee, mending their nets and he called to them, Immediately they left their boat and their father and followed him. Jesus went throughout all Galilee, teaching in the, their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness, sickness among the people. So his fame spread throughout all Syria and they brought him all the sick who were afflicted with various diseases and pains people possessed by demons, or having epilepsy, or afflicted with paralysis. He cured them, and great crowds followed him from Galilee, Jerusalem, Judea, and from beyond the Jordan. And now Matthew 5, 1 through 16. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you, falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets 
who were before you. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its taste, how can saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything, but is thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. People do not light a lamp and put it under a bushel basket. Rather, they put it on a lampstand and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. It's always a question of whether I'm going or not going to wear glasses. Well, it was just this time of year in September of uh, 10 years ago, 11 years ago, uh, my wife and I had both retired and our family, my daughter-in-law and my son, and uh, their children are living here in Lancaster area, and uh, no reason for me to stay where I was, so I uh, and my wife moved here, and not knowing anyone at all except my daughter-in-law and my son and their children. So, uh, like a good pastor, uh, we visited several churches, and uh, I am rather speculative, if not critical, of church worship services, and it was not a good experience for me on several occasions. Uh, and then I came here, and uh, it was immediately engaging. I, I love the pastor who was here. Uh, Larry is just a great guy. Uh, the music was fantastic. The scouting and mission program was great. We had this uh, sort of weird attorney who went up to the jailhouse, which I thought was rather striking. And uh, we had these mission people came every month uh, in October and November and stuff. I, wow, I like this place. And then after church, I got to meet people and I thought, uh, this is home. And, uh, and it has become home. And uh, you're, you're now my family because I don't have any other family. And uh, I had to leave all my friends behind. And so here I am in my church, which is my home. So when I'm here on Sunday mornings and sitting in the second pew because I can't hear much till I get my earphones on, uh, now, this is going to seem supercilious, but I'm going to say it anyway. Uh, I have around my house, if you know where I live, five different gardens. I have a rose garden in the front, a rose garden in the back, a flower garden on my the east side, a viewing side on the left that looks into the Hawking Hills, and I have another actual garden garden in the back, and I have benches and chairs at all those places. I need space like that to be and meditate. Well, when I'm sitting here in that second pew, it's like I'm sitting in one of those gardens with flowers all around me. I need those flowers. I need geraniums. I need roses. I need petunias. I need all kinds of flowers. And, and you're my flower sitting around uh, to become active with me in this world and as a meditative opportunity for me. And uh, that's, that's how I feel when I'm, I'm in worship. That's the good side. Good side to know that I've met a man that likes clocks. I met another man that likes to garden. And yet, what I've been absolutely obsessed with over the last 20 years is the massive exodus from churches. It, as you know, has been overwhelming me for quite some time. But it's not just churches. Downtown we have that massive mason building. There are not masons there anymore. There are a group of Masons, and Mr. Carr is a part of that, but it's a very, very small group. Bowling alleys are empty. Fire departments are empty. Elks are empty. International Order of Odd Fellows is empty. That's the way it is. That's just the way it is. 
people are turning away from the church and even from sacred spaces. And this morning, I want to talk about evangelizing conversations. And if we're going to have evangelizing conversations out there in this world to help bring people back into the church, then we need to know what the obstacles are to those conversations. I mean, if, if you're an attorney, you don't go into the courtroom if you don't know what the defense or the prosecutors are going to say, well, if you're going to have a conversation with someone about coming to church, you best know what these issues are that you're going to face. And so I want to do them very quickly. What are the in-depth issues keeping people away from church today? It's going to be fast. Christianity is so vague and has so many definitions in the society today, it doesn't mean anything. I just passed a church yesterday when I was out driving. It's called the Church of Abundant Blessings and Grace. Now, you may think that's wonderful, but what it means in that church is if you come there, you're going to get rich. It's abundant blessings of wealth. Uh, the second one is that uh, m many of us are in the greatest generation. We were born before the end of the Second World War. But I can tell you that the people born since the Second World War uh, don't agree with much of what we have to say. That is, uh, all of my young, all of my family, my children's friends, all of them are absolutely abhorred when they hear the talk, church talk negatively about LGBTQA people. They, they don't care about that. It's immaterial to them. But to hear churches ranting about that issue is a real turnoff. Third, the, politi the politicalization of the church. Uh, in the last eight years, it, 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 it's just been disastrous. Uh, young people today think that for the Southern Baptist to think that Donald Trump is King David and belongs in the presidency, uh, young people today just think that's absolute apostasy. That just Now, he may be president, he may be a good man, he may do all that, but not to place a, a political person as God's agent. That, that just doesn't go well with young people. Fourth, we live in a world of science, and I talked about that a, a couple of weeks ago. We live in a world of science. If it is not scientifically verifiable, it's not true and it doesn't exist. That's today's mentality. It's the STEM world. Well, faith is not based on science, so it makes it tough. Fifth, time. Time. Our families today are broken and separated and there's everything under the sun going on and both people in the family are working if it's a married couple with children and so by the time Saturday and Sunday get here they want to go grocery shopping, they want to relax, they want to be with their kids, they want to clean the house, they do not want to be in church. So it's a matter of what's competing for our, for our time and it's not just the church. As I said, uh, bowling alleys are empty, fire departments are empty, it's not just church. The next one, which seems to me to be particularly uh, obvious and present for us is the sense of a flawed church. I've been here now 10, 10 years or more and, and people think that oh my goodness this church has some flaws. We've made mistakes. People have committed sins. Well let me tell you something. I come from a big family. At one time I had over a hundred blood relatives living in the Ohio Valley. That's a great way to know the church because some of my relatives are bozos. Some are bonkers. Some are nasty. Some have been in jail. Some are addicts. Well, isn't that the church? I mean, that's just my family. That's what the church is, my family. I just expect the church to be a bit bonkers. We make mistakes, but the fact is, people think, oh my God, the church is flawed. I can't, can't deal with that. The next is uh, obligations of being a Christian obligations of being a, I don't really want to be a Christian most of the time. Sometimes I would really like to smack somebody. More than once I'd like to smack somebody. Turn the other cheek? I don't think so. You know, I, that's just not my idea of fun. So that's a tough one, just being a Christian and the expectations is uh, forgiveness, uh, as a congregation, we have a tough time with forgiveness, and if you don't know that, I'm alerting you to that fact. So it's tough to forgive people, and, and for some reason, which I don't grasp at all, 
In our culture today, there's, there's not a sense of yearning for eternal life or forgiveness. We don't need forgiveness. We haven't done anything wrong. I mean, let's, let's face it. For, for instance, in families, do you know what percent of the population are actually married and with children living together at home? If you don't know that, just look it up on the web, and it will startle you to no end. So the idea of sin, forgiveness, and all that stuff, out the window. And then, uh, as Sue knows, nobody, uh, not nobody, but in the 360 Americans, maybe 10% have actually heard a church organ play, maybe 15. We live in a society that knows basically nothing about the scripture. They simply don't know what Christianity is from the inside out. So we are missionaries in an alien world. That's a fact. Whether you want to believe it or not, it's a fact. You look at people under the age of 50 and they ain't in church and the kids are at a sports arena. In fact, that's why many churches today are in sports arenas or building churches like as if it's a sports arena. We live in a sports culture and that's taking first place. So you're going to find in your bulletin, and I haven't looked at it actually, there should be in your bulletin five books identifying Jesus. I think they should be in there, I don't know. But they are, just ask me, I'll tell you later. The best five books to understand who Jesus is should be printed in your bulletin. So now let's get to the scripture lesson, this cool scripture lesson, and try to understand what in the world's happening when Jesus enters the scene on the Sea of Galilee and is talking to the young fisherman. He says, come fisherman, follow me. And there's a word. She read it twice. I believe this. It said, and they immediately left their nets and followed him. Isn't that a cool word? They immediately left their nets and followed him. Wow. Wouldn't you like to be able to walk up to somebody today and say, hey, come to church, and they immediately left work and came with you to church? Well, I've explained about the world. Jesus' call to the disciples was not in a vacuum. Jesus' call to the disciples was in a very particular time in history. And uh, I'm going to try to skip most of that part of my, my message this morning. Jesus was well known. It said right in the scripture, he was well known. He had been teaching. He was a child prodigy. So throughout the Galilean region, he was well known. Now, what was happening in the culture, in the society in which Jesus lived in 30 AD, or now common era? You know what was happening. The Galilean poor people, the no people, the lesser people, the Pharisee people actually, in the north, didn't get along with the Sadducee people in the south who ran the synagogue and the churches. Tremendous fighting, infighting amongst the church people of Jesus' time, synagogues. But that wasn't the real problem. The real problem was that Rome, King Agrippa, Pontius Pilate, Rome was controlling the nation. And there was tremendous power of politics and military between the Palestinian people, Hebrew people, and Rome. And Jesus was executed. John the Baptist was executed. Paul was executed. John was exiled to Atmos. Thomas went off to India. In fact, just a few years after Jesus' death and resurrection, as you know, Nero and the Roman army wiped out the country, and for 2,000 years there no longer was any Israel. So, what happened? 22 years ago, tomorrow, the twin trade towers, the Pentagon, and the Pennsylvania crashes occurred. Then what happened? Immediately, I like that word, immediately, over 750,000 young people in America joined the armed forces. Get that. Almost a million people immediately rose up to join the American forces. 
So what was Jesus doing when he asked the disciples in the midst of a coming war, when John the Baptist is saying, look folks, even now the ax is laid to the root of the tree, when this past week, past governor from where? Out west in the south, Arkansas, a guy named Huckabee said on a major news channel during his monologue, if President Biden succeeds in keeping ex-President Trump from this election, it will be the last ballot in America. It will become a country of bullets. He just said that, major TV, this past week. So I want to say something to you that's, that's going to maybe seem crazy. None of that's relevant. DeSantis ballyhoo in Florida about race and sex and history and all this stuff. Bogus. None of that stuff. It's all a scam. It's a red herring. It's trying to get our minds away from what's happening. And what's happening is we have 60 million Americans living in poverty. That's what's happening. We have a disparity of wealth in this country that is unbelievable. It's thought that Bezos will be a trillionaire in 10 to 15 years. Try to get a picture of what's happening. It hasn't anything to do with race, my friends. It has to do with economics and the potential of violence. I don't know about you, but when I look at all the issues going on today in our world, I am extremely uncomfortable. My sense of community, I don't have until I came here. In fact, there are a dozen issues that are going on in our culture that are critical to our survival. Just being nice to one another, just being family. But we have economic fatigue and a dozen other things that are, are happening. So what I want to focus on is this sense of community. Climate change, mental health. Do you know the death rate of veterans by suicide in America today? It's unbelievable. Look it up. Addictions right here in Chillicothe and Circleville? Look it up. Wealth disparities, homelessness, gun violence, not to mention international warfares. So I want to focus on the sense of community. The only way I can mentally survive is knowing that I have a friend here with whom I can talk simply about nothing. I need people like that. I need my rose garden. I, th I think about you and clocks all the time. I just saw another one yesterday and I almost bought it. Almost but the cost of shipping from California was $92. And I said, I'm not giving you 92 bucks for a clock. It may not run, see? I don't do that. I don't do that. I need community. I need family. New York Times editorial yesterday, number one. Loneliness in America is killing us. If you haven't seen it, look it up. It's easy to do. Get on the web. You'll find it. Loneliness in America is killing us. We're no longer a society that goes to the volunteer fire department or goes to the Elks or goes to IOOF or goes to church. People are staying home watching TV or fixing dinner or whatever it is they're doing. So the world is uh, difficult. And I know I'm preaching way too long. But I, I want to tell you just for a moment about a guy named, uh, who wrote my favorite poem. His name is uh, Rainer Rilke. He was born in 1875. He was known as the poet of Europe. Brilliant man. He was uh, Rodin's secretary for two years. Unfortunately, he lived in a time when there was no help for him psychologically. He was a serious, serious manic depressive. And uh, it was cyclical, uh, as many manic depressives are. And about every three years, he would go into a massive uh, depression cycle in which he saw monsters and demons 
uh, that he would see all kinds of, of awful things in his, uh, in his manic or in his depression stage. And uh, he, he wrote this beautiful poem. Uh, I'm going to do it in English. It's not, a, read it in German, it's a Sagadichte, O oh, say poet, but we'll do it in English. Don't forget, we're talking about a world of demons. I am living in a world of demons. I don't know about you, but I have people who are mentally ill in my family. I have people in prison in my family. I have addicts in my family, and I can't fix them. It is out of my capacity to fix, and it drives me nuts. So here's what Rilke wrote. I'm translating. Tell us, poet, what do you do? Now they're talking about Rilke, the crazy man. Tell us, poet, what do you do? And Rilke says, I praise. Yes, but what about the deadly and the monstrous phase of your life? How do you deal with that? How do you resist those monsters? And Rilke says, I praise. But what about when you're anonymous, when you're nothing, when you're nameless? How do you bring yourself forward from your craziness? I praise. What right is you? What right do you have? How can you take it upon yourself in all these varied ways? How do you live under a thousand masks and be true? And he says, I praise. And what about when life is totally still in nothingness? Or when it's a roaring blaze in your manic phase? You have both a star life and you have a storm life. How do you deal with that? And Rilke says, I praise. Isn't that a great poem? Isn't that fantastic? No matter how awful the world, I praise. We are living in a world of demons and monsters. We're living in a world, if you look around and don't just simply think about a small little privacy of our own world, there's a lot of that in it. So when I read the New York Times, uh, and instead of shooting myself, I think about Rilke's poem. So what happens? Jesus, living in a time of the discipleship, countries going to go up in flames, wars coming, and Jesus says, come follow me. Now, here's the tragedy. You think, and you've been taught, that Judas betrayed Jesus. I didn't know what you were taught, right? Judas betrayed Jesus. That's not right. In his mind, and in Peter's mind, and in Thomas' mind, Jesus betrayed them. They thought they were being called into a military. You read the scripture, it says they carried knives. They, they were ready for warfare. So when the bottom line came and Judas realized what was happening, and it wasn't an army that Jesus was calling, it was a kingdom of heaven, a kingdom of love, peace, forgiveness. Judas said, oh no, I have been betrayed. Jesus was trying to bring about a new kingdom, not the kingdom of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, not the kingdom of the power of Rome, but a different kind of kingdom, a kingdom where people gather to love one another. For me, the most important part of our worship service is the prayer, the prayer we have of a plea for forgiveness. Why is that? Because if you and I are willing to ask for forgiveness, it means that we must assume a sense of humility, a sense of our own brokenness. I mean, I can look at one of my crazy brothers and say, oh, you're, you're in bad shape. But if I do the prayer of confession, I'm not looking at my brother, am I? The prayer of confession says I have to look at myself. The prayer of confession says I'm broken. The prayer of confession says, I do not live up to the glory of God. And I pray that in the world of God's kingdom, I'll be forgiven. And so we must forgive one another. That's why I need the church. Now, think about the church, and then I'm done with the last paragraph. When Jesus was crucified, shortly thereafter, within 20 years, there were churches at Ephesus, Galatia, Philippi, Corinth, Rome, Colossae, Thessalonica, and others around the Asia Minor. Within 200 years after that, 
the Roman, the Roman Catholic Church was proclaimed the religion of Europe. Think of that. The Roman Christendom, within 200 years, the church became the church of Europe. Because we offer here to one another a sense of caring, a sense of knowing that we're all broken, a sense of knowing that we're all full of sin and that mainly we all live in a world that's more than we can fix. You can't fix it, Gay. You can't fix it, Steve. You can't fix it. Every doctor knows it's all in the meantime because you don't have a cure for aging process. You can't fix it. So what I do is I think about the church and how we can bring people into it. You are and I are a congregation of witnesses of this new kingdom, a kingdom that's filled with the spirit of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, loyalty, and self-control. Church in which I think we need to be sensitive, thoughtful, engaged, and merciful. I left this out of my sermon two weeks ago. Also, not only those things, but knowing that none of us have any ground on which to stand without God's grace. So when we begin our evangelizing conversations with people to invite friends and neighbors into a community that I found here among you, it's a community that helps me navigate the turgid waters of the world, makes living on this earth tolerable, makes it worthwhile, it makes it manageable. And by golly, there are even moments of joy there are even moments of joy and love and peace. Uh, you, you, you get around Chip back there. You get around Chip for five minutes, and if you're not laughing, you haven't found him yet. Uh, that man, uh, I'm not going to say it. Uh, Chip can make a donkey laugh, honest. He, he, he just, he's just got whatever it is to do it, see? And uh, Sarah Lynn. Now, I met her husband 10 years ago in a little prayer group. She's been taking care of him. You, can you think of anything more Christian in your life? See, see what I mean about being in a garden of flowers and knowing people? I invite people into whom we are, a community that helps us navigate and live on this earth and find places of love and joy and peace and patience and kindness. So for all those things, I am grateful. Oh man, and I know that's too long. Now I have a bulletin somewhere. I don't know. It's, it's disappeared. Two verses of the hymns. Sermon is over, and we're going to affirm our faith. Let us stand. This is a great text. Oh, let, me, let me make a personal note. I know and knew personally for three years, from 68 to 71, I knew personally the three, the two men who, who wrote this, uh, E.A. Dowie and Charles West, uh, brilliant fellows uh, with the other committee who did this confession. So I know it rather well, and, and it's great. So let us affirm this confession from 1967, uh, and it's great. God's reconciling act in Jesus Christ is a mystery which the scriptures describe in various ways. It is called the sacrifice of the lamb, a shepherd's life given for a sheep, atonement by a priest. Again, it is a ransom of a slave, payment of debt, of legal penalty, and victory over the powers of evil. These are expressions of a truth which remains beyond the reach of all theory in the depths of God's love for humankind. They reveal the gravity, the cost, and the sure achievement of God's reconciling work. Ladies. <laughs>
conflict this morning. I, I have an absolutely gorgeous robe. It has three chevrons on the side. And just all kinds of pyramids to throw over my back and a hood. Doesn't do much. It's too hot. I don't wear it. I put a vest on. This is close as I could get to a suit this morning. But there is a question in today's world. Do clergy wear tennis shoes and blue jeans, flannel shirts, or do we wear a suit, or do we wear a robe? That's a, you may not think so, but that's a big question in the clergy world. I want to go back now to a celebration that's now 4,000 years old. It began in Egypt when the Hebrews were slaves, and they were saved by taking the blood of the lamb and putting it over the door. So when the angel of death came, they would be spared. And there were those 10 wonderful miracles that enabled them to escape from Egypt. And so every year following that event 4,000 years ago, the Jewish people celebrate Seder. It's a memory to that extraordinary event that basically recreated the people of the Hebrew world. That persisted for two thousand years, the building of the great uh, temple, three thousand years ago under King Solomon, and then right up to the time of Jesus. In fact, that's what Jesus was doing. Jesus was celebrating the Seder. It was a day for him to do that. And so he gathered the disciples together. They had the Seder meal together. And it was remarkable, because when the meal was over, there was still food left. And then something happened. He took the bread that was left, and he picked it up, and he broke it. And then he said a prayer. And he said, this bread is my body broken for you. We now have a new kingdom. It's a new kingdom we're bringing into being. The old kingdom is no longer. A new kingdom, not of warfare. A new kingdom of love and peace and sacrifice and forgiveness. So he broke the bread and he gave it to him and he said, every time you eat bread, and of course they're going to eat bread three times a day, Every time you eat bread, you will be showing forth my life, my death, my resurrection, and this new kingdom. And so he broke it and he gave it to them. Now he knew what was going to happen, and there was wine left. And so he took the wine of Seder and he poured it, and he shared that with them. And he said, you know, this wine is a new covenant old covenant is gone. This is a new covenant I make with you. As often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you will show forth my death until I come again, creating the kingdom. So now, break this bread. And we pour this cup. A celebration that's now 2,000 years old. As some of you know, in my ministry I've conducted almost 800 funerals and a number of baptisms and done a number of weddings. When I'm at this communion table, those people's lives are in me. I know them. I knew them. I cared about them. I loved them. And they were a part of my life. 
So part of my communion service is remembering those who have gone before us. And you may do that also. Attorney Johnson back there, I remember him. I remember Sue when she sang, I remember her. But I also am looking forward to the children not here yet who are going to be taking communion in 10 years from now, or 20 years from now, or 30 years from now, participating also. And my message today is for you to call people into this new kingdom, the new covenant, the new community of which we are a part and which I call home. Let us pray. Wonderful God, we pray that you will lift up our lives, lift up this bread and this juice, that you will transform us into the new people you are calling us to be, that as we eat the bread and drink the wine, we will certainly know of this person, Jesus, who leads us, teaches us, loves us, lived for us, suffered for us, died for us, rose for us, sits on the right hand of God and prays for us. For we pray it in his name. Amen. My friends, the Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Let us pray continuously, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. bread of life.
face to the rising sun. Isn't that a beautiful hymn? Uh, thanks, Susan. I appreciated that very much. Take. You may be seated because I'm going to do the prayer. Thanks, Stephen. You're going to cover. Say something. I want to give praise and thanks to God our Father and to all of you. My daughter in law rang the cancer bell on Friday. She is cancer free and does not have to do the last three chemos. Thank the Lord. Yes, thank you. Thank you. And uh, we know that. John Bond is back in the hospital, but hopefully he'll be out this afternoon. Some mornings, God, we can smell the scent of the roses wafting across us. Some mornings, God, the mist of the morning and the haze of the day are cleared away and we see things brilliantly alive and filled with color. Sometimes the evening stars are blinded from us by the clouds and then in the early waking morning they shine brightly once again. Sometimes, O oh God, the world of darkness is our friend. Sometimes the world of dreams is our friend. Sometimes we wake up refreshed. Sometimes the days are wonderful. So we give you thanks for all those who experience your healing we give you thanks for those whose lives are filled with joy. But on this beautiful fall day, we give you thanks for the Ash Cave. We give you thanks for Bach Hollow. We give you thanks for the Old Band's Cave. We give you thanks for the Cedar Falls. We give you thanks for the hundred parks in the city of Lancaster. We give you thanks for the Kakomarker Park. We give you thanks, O oh God, for places of refuge, of places of meditation, places where our bodies are healed, our souls are healed, our spirits are renewed. We give you thanks for them all, and we give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we do live in the real world, and we all call upon to be generous in that world. So would the ushers come forth for our tithes and offerings.
Gracious God, we give you thanks for these gifts that have been given. We pray that they'll flow out into the world, helping your kingdom of joy and love come to fruition. We pray you'll bless these gifts and those who have given. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. positions of Nazareth, Capernaum, and the Sea of Galilee, I would like to also announce two other geographical places. One is the Westminster Church House where you go through those doors downstairs and have coffee and talk with one another. The other is you go through those doors and down the steps and then another set of steps to a library. And if you would like to help be a planner for the community meal that we do once a month, we'd love it if four or five of you might be willing to get your coffee and go down to the library and join us for discussing about planning the meals uh, for our uh, monthly meal program. Now, my friends, let us go out into the world in peace and have courage and hold on to those things that are good, returning to no one evil for evil, but strengthening the faint-hearted and supporting the weak. And as we do, the God who created us, the God who continuously picks us up when we have fallen, that God will be with you now and forevermore. Go in peace. Amen.